I'm John Batchelor. I welcome Matt Rechtel of the New York Times. The fact that the snow cap in the Sierra Nevada is at a 500-year low translates into people's lives. But how? What does this mean for the state of California to say that there's a drought? There have been droughts before. Several years ago, there was a 75- or 50-year drought in Texas. And I recall the reporting from South Texas especially. People were turning each other in for their lawns. If your lawn wasn't exactly brown enough, you were suspect. That was then. This is now because... The trouble in California is not likely to be mended with an El Nino, even an abundant El Nino, one or two. The aquifer is being depleted. This is the the foundation for water that's brought us the Golden State of California these last several hundred years. Matt, a very good evening to you. The practical way people translate. Generally, before I read your story, I was told that the residential saving of water was doing very well. Is that correct? Good evening to you, Matt. Yeah, they're doing. They, it's do, it's doing pretty well. They've uh, they've cut it back. People have cut it back sharply. Um, a little bit surprising because, as you say, uh, this can feel uh, well. It can feel very distant. You know, you you're still flushing and drinking. So, um, what causes people to to uh, connect to this? It's challenging. The nagging state or the nanny state. Neither sound very attractive. But is it a joke now? <laughs> do people in the in the in the supermarkets when they run into each other and they're buying soda pop? Do they talk about it? This, this, it is a regular conversation now. Uh, how, you know, people are actually checking their water bills and trying to outdo one another's consumption uh, every month. How many how many gallons per person per day? It's it's quite interesting. It's become a a currency, if you will. But but naggy state is the right word. We're all getting on each other's cases out here. The children lead the way, and there's a photograph accompanying your piece that is inspiring if it's true. Can you stand there and watch your children tell you or inform on you to you yourself that your shower was too long or you flushed the toilet too many times? Well, I mean, you know, what what child is not waiting for the opportunity to, to tell a parent that they're doing the very thing that they tell the child not to do? Right. Um, I, I want I'll, I'll say I, I want to say one thing on, a, on an actually quite serious note on this. So what what we're talking about, what the story gets into is the, this culture of nagging that um, can be mostly lighthearted and a little bit annoying, um, as you'll see in the story that I've done. I can tell, share you an anecdote. But when it comes to kids, there's actually a very interesting bit of subtext or history here, which is when it comes to major cultural shifts like seatbelts or drunk driving, safety advocates will point to children nagging their parents as a crucial part of the equation and that that's why sometimes these things take generations uh, to see change and we're seeing that here with kids who have been admonished don't brush that long don't shower that long then telling their parents and sort of you get a virtuous cycle if you will because this is going on right now i'm wondering how it's living matt day to day in the commercial part of the world not at home the commercial part of the world, do people, and because that can be confrontational in businesses in New York or on the hallway in New York, do you see any friction in, in well, you're in the San Francisco Bay Area, but this extends all the way to Southern California and all the way to the New York. Do you hear friction in commercial enterprises? Yeah, um, by, let me, let me um, speak specifically to agriculture, and I don't know if you're, are you including that in commercial yeah, yeah, here? Yes, fine, because there's a lot of suspicion that agriculture is using too, many, uh, too much water. I've talked to farmers, especially in the Central Valley, and they have some extremely sophisticated ways of, of watering their, their crops, and they're making very hard decisions about what crops to save and not, so please continue. Yeah, I mean, you, you've hit it on the head, and I don't think you can generalize about farmers any more than you could generalize about business people at, at, at large. Some are, some are working very, very hard um, to make cutbacks and are making very tough choices. Um, some are, you know, dipping into each other's water supplies, and you actually are seeing enormous tension around this. I'd, I'd refer you to an article that I did a, uh, maybe oh, six weeks ago or two months ago about farmers that are fighting over the aquifers locally and, and really getting into each other's business. Um, and in, the, in that case, it's not so much who is failing to save, but who is sucking up one another's water rights. And those are very challenging circumstances. Um, on, the, on the commercial 
day-to-day commercial circumstance like somebody at a business wasting water. I haven't heard too much of that. The one story that I did hear um, that was related is, um, and I included in, in the, the Times piece, is that, is that someone will walk, said he would walk up to other people in the office and say, don't throw that water down the sink. You've either got to drink it or water a plant with it. I mean, those, those are the kinds of things where, I, you know, they're, they're kind of amusing um, and they're kind of painful in a way to listen to, but they also hit at something else, which is they're painful because we are learning to deal with scarcity among, around something that we really need for life. You know, it, it would be like as if oxygen were scarce. And that's a bit of a scary thing to have someone remind you, hey, this thing you need to survive is in um, historically short supply. Because you look at the big picture, that's your nature, Matt. Um, we have so much water here. I spray it all around. You understand. This is New York. We manufacture water. All right. And I imagine... <laughs> and remind me before you leave, I got a story for you about that, but go ahead. I, I imagine what scarcity is. But to my understanding, and I've done enough reporting on this to know the big picture, this is not going to get better. It, El Nino is not going to rescue California. You've got a population density that perhaps cannot depend upon what's left in the aquifer. And that means that these remedies at home with the children or even at the office are not a solution. They are a transition phase, correct? Yeah, yeah, no. Uh, I mean, that that would be, we, again, none of us can predict exactly what's going to happen, but El Nino, uh, first of all, is probably a singular event, and second of all, we're not even sure where it hits and, and when. You can look at the percentages, you know, 90 you know, 97% chance of an extremely strong El Nino or whatever the number is that hits around December. But we don't know what that means for where. Will it Will it come down as rain? Will it come as snowpack that begets more rain? That is not – anybody who looks at that as something beyond maybe helpful for the ski season for one, you know, or, or another season of farming – is is fooling him or herself. So you're right. Well, let's talk about transition. All right. You know, someone said to me, um, you know, I feel like our children are going to be like, are, are going to be to water what Depression era, you know, kids were to say food and new toys. Um, and what really you're asking is, is this a Depression era that will pass or, I'm sorry to use the phrase, it's so overused, the new normal where we're going to grow accustomed to things like brown as the new green, where we're going to grow accustomed to things like putting our water uh, that we use to wash our dishes, letting it flow into a bucket that we then use for our plants, where we're going to look outside at the trees we once cherished around our house and think that those were complete luxuries. I mean, I think, I think that's, that's a little bit of the scary period that we're in now. Um, and I think, you know, the more so for a place like the Los Angeles Basin that is so dependent on water from elsewhere. Because we're looking out ahead, government is participating in this. The recommendations from Sa- Sacramento are aggressive there. Uh, and your reporting, and I follow this from other points of view, is consistent with a, with very good public spirit about this. However, are there meetings? Are people talking about moving, Matt? Has it come to that? You know, um, I hate, John, this always happens when you preempt my uh, story that I'm contemplating um, right. with you, a question. You're, so, a, you're a logical so, science fiction thinker, Matt. I just everybody got Everybody turn off the radio. Yeah, okay. But, you know, one of the, one of the things I have been wondering, um, and I, I, might be, I might be wrong about this. I mean, you, you start, you ask questions, and I start with questions, and I don't report them unless the answers make any sense. But I've been wondering about places like Portland and Seattle that have seen less rainfall. Um, now, it's complicated there because they've seen a variety, you know, some other changes in their meteorology. But imagine if instead of go west, young man, it was go north, young man, and those places became a new California. Or you can imagine that a place like San Francisco, which has been so cold and wet, gets a few degrees warmer, and it starts to look a lot more desirable because it still has some precipitation and fog, which are, you know, can be very welcomed by people, but still draws its, and draws its, its water from a more reliable source. I think you're asking the right question. I don't know that we've seen the demographic patterns yet, but, but I certainly think a few years of this and migration patterns have to change. 
Matt Richtel for the New York Times. I mentioned that Matt is an author I follow very carefully. His most recent book is nonfiction, A Deadly Wandering, A Mystery, A Landmark Investigation, The Astonishing Science of Attention in the Digital Age. That's about what can go wrong with your iPhone or your smartphone. Now we're talking about what can go wrong when there's insufficient water. I'm John Batchelor. This is The John Batchelor Show. <laughs> 